Morning everyone. Um, can I welcome members to the 26th meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, we've had apologies from David Torrance and Monica Lennon and welcome once again to Colin Beatty. Uh, as proposed, the committee takes items 6, 7 and 8 in private. Uh, these items are consideration of uh, our approach to the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill, the Committee's annual report and evidence heard on the European Union Withdrawal Bill. Does the Committee agree to take items 6, 7 and 8 in private? Okay. Um, uh, the Committee were, will return to public session for item 9 at 1pm. So agenda item 2. Uh, European Union Withdrawal Bill. Um, I welcome Professor Alan Page, uh, Professor of Public Law, University of Dundee, to our meeting. Hello. Uh, <coughs> and we'll go straight to questions. Um, I'll ask the first set. So, if we can ask you, Professor Page, the bill confers wide powers on UK and devolved ministers to correct retained EU law, is the broad scope of those powers appropriate and necessary, in your view? Thank you. Um, as you said in your, your question, it confers broad powers on uh, both UK uh, and Scottish ministers, and if you will permit me, I'd like to approach it from the point of view, first of all, of the powers that it will confer on UK ministers, because what the bill involves, or will see, or entail, is a massive increase uh, in the powers conferred on UK ministers uh, to make subordinate legislation in the devolved areas in consequence of EU withdrawal uh, Brexit. Um, I think that one of the key points to note about that, to which I think uh, not enough attention has been paid so far, is that under the Scotland Act, under the devolution settlement, the powers of UK ministers to legislate in the devolved areas, I'm talking about the powers of ministers as opposed to the powers of the UK Parliament, are very, very limited. There is no executive equivalent uh, of the sovereignty of the UK Parliament in relation to um, the devolved areas. But what we will see as a consequence of this bill, assuming it is enacted in its current form, is a massive increase uh, in these powers, which for me raises two questions. Uh, one, are they warranted? Are they justified? Uh, and is the, or are the safeguards to which their exercise is proposed to be subject, uh, are they sufficient? Um, and to the first of these questions, I would say I could see the case for conferring powers on UK ministers to legislate in the devolved areas in consequence of Brexit, but um, the safeguards, in my view, are completely insufficient. Um, at the moment, all, they will be subject simply to a non-binding requirement of consultation with the Scottish ministers with no provision for uh, Scottish parliamentary scrutiny or consent to their exercise. And it would be very difficult, I think, to come up with a lawmaking system that is further removed from that uh, envisaged uh, under, the, under the devolution settlement. So that would be my starting point. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are the powers clearly expressed? For example, it's, uh, is it clear in Clause 7 what is meant by the power to prevent, remedy or mitigate deficiencies? Um, what is meant by retained EU law and what constitutes a failure in it? And will it be clear whether or not a deficiency arises from the UK's withdrawal from the EU? The question of clarity. Um, yes, I suppose there, there, is, there is scope for argument uh, as to how clear these, these powers are. Um, as far as clause, is concern, clause 7 is concerned, to which you draw attention, um, I think it states that deficiencies in EU law include but are not limited to, in other words, it's simply illustrative, it's not an exhaustive definition. Um, a failure of reta retained EU law um, could include a failure to operate effectively, and then you have a wide range of other cases where the law doesn't function appropriately or sensibly. Um, 
We could talk about how clear that is. Um, perhaps the thing to which attention ought to be drawn is that the test, the ultimate test, is whether or not the minister considers it appropriate uh, to make provision. And that is what lawyers refer to as a subjective as opposed to objective test. What matters is the opinion of the minister. And it's worth bearing in mind that, uh, and we'll maybe come on to this later on, that we're not just talking about one minister. <laughs> we're talking about a lot of ministers uh, who may have differing views as to what is, is and is not appropriate. Uh, so, yes, you can see uh, scope for differing interpretations of what is or what is not appropriate um, and uh, consequent concerns about what uh, mm -hmm. exactly that might entail in terms of UK lawmaking or subordinate lawmaking in the devolved areas, or more generally. Yeah, um, so as you say, it is, a, it is down to personal opinion of, of the ministers. So that mm -hmm. takes me on to my next question. You know, what, what are the consequences of any ambiguities in the way the powers are expressed, and what might be the implications of these ambiguities? Um, consequences of ambiguities, simply, I think, the principal consequence is that it creates scope for argument, uh, dispute as to what is and is not uh, warranted or justified uh, under, the, uh, under the legislation. A lack of certainty, if you like. Yeah. I mean, in, in your view, in, in, in the bill, should all this be cleared up? Um, if there are things, and I, I'm, I'm not pretending to have a concluded view on, on any of this, but if there are things which are genuinely unclear, uh, which are genuinely ambiguous, then of course, uh, then these should be clarified. The ambiguities ought to be resolved. Um, I, I'm slightly hesitant in saying that because, you know, I'm conscious that this is taking place or the, the legislation is being enacted against the background of what is actually a, a challenge on a, on a scale which is actually unprecedented outside wartime. Uh, and I think it's important not, not to lose sight of just how big the task is, which raises questions as to whether or not it is in fact doable. And it's understandable, therefore, that um, broad powers should be sought to address uh, the consequences, not knowing what all those consequences are uh, at the moment at which you're seeking seeking those powers. So yes, um, if there are ambiguities, if there is a lack of clarity, then yes, of course, we ought to resolve that. Yeah. Uh, but I wouldn't... I'm slightly concerned about the approach which emphasises, or is at risk of overemphasising, in my view, simply making changes to the legislation. Um, I think if we're talking about safeguards, then we need to look beyond uh, the letter of the statute, uh, the bill as enacted, and think about what other sorts of safeguards uh, we might be realistically looking at uh, in relation to the exercise of those powers. In other words, not putting all our faith in the way in which the powers are expressed, bearing in mind what I've already said about the subjective test and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, should any additional restrictions or limitations apply to the exercise of powers under clauses 7, 8 or 9 um, and the equivalent powers of the devolved authorities, as drafted, those clauses enable ministers to make such provision as they, as you've said, consider appropriate. Can the limitations be made more objective? Uh, well, I doubt you would get away from the subjective approach that I've, I've talked, talked about as a you will not end up, I don't think we're going to end up with an objective approach. Um, there are um, additional restrictions which have been suggested or talked about, uh, which reflect real concerns about the use that might be made of these powers. Um, one is um, that they're exercised. This is, this is all being presented or depicted as straightforward, and I put that word in, quotation marks, a straightforward exercising in getting the statute book into shape um, as a consequence of Brexit. In other words, a, a, if you like, a technical tidying up exercise. You know, 
if we simply convert EU law into UK law, then we recognise it's not going to work uh, uh, simply in those terms. Therefore, we need to sort that out. And that is being presented or talked about in technical tidying up revision uh, terms. There is a concern uh, which one might want to address in the legislation about the possibility of policy, substantive policy changes being made under the guise of technical changes. Mm. So we're tidying this up, but actually uh, we're making decisions which might, uh, changes which might uh, perfectly legitimately uh, be the subject of dispute, or we're going further than is necessary or is appropriate in order to uh, achieve uh, our particular goal. And one might therefore talk about revising the legislation to make these kinds of restrictions uh, clear on the face of it. Okay, thank you. Final question uh, from me for now. Um, Schedule 4 confers wide powers to create or modify fees or charges in connection with EU withdrawal uh, and associated changes to public authority functions is the scope of those powers appropriate? This is not something which I've, I've got a concluded view on. Uh, I recognise that it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, because I assume, uh, well, for a long time now, uh, we've sought to recover the costs of various public activities from those who are subject to regulation and so on. Uh, I assume that applies in the EU context. I don't actually know. And this is about making analogous provision um, post-Brexit. Um, but I don't, I don't have a view as to whether or not these, these powers go further than would be appropriate in the circumstances. OK, fair enough. Um, I'll move on now with uh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Um, the bill provides a choice of three legislative routes uh, to exercise of the powers of correction regulations made by UK ministers, acting alone, regulations made by the devolved authority acting alone, and also regulations made jointly by the UK ministers and a devolved authority. What challenges do you see actually arising from having uh, that choice of legislative routes? Well, working out which, which route is going to be used um, in a particular case, um, that is, that, that's the key question. Um, as to the three possibilities, I think the joint exercise of powers, I would leave that to one side uh, and regard that as something of a non-starter, if only because it will require scrutiny approval in two parliaments. And therefore, I think the practical choice comes down to, is this going to be done by Scottish ministers in the devolved areas, or is it going to be done by UK ministers? Now, I, I would imagine that we would start with a presumption which exists. Um, there is such a presumption in relation to the transposition of EU obligations in the devolved areas at present, a presumption in favour of uh, corrections being made by Scottish ministers rather than by UK ministers which would in turn uh, bring in uh, Scottish parliamentary scrutiny of, of the exercise of those powers. At the same time, uh, one can see a case for making changes, making corrections on a UK-wide or GB-wide basis. In other words, those changes being made by UK ministers. That happens at present in relation to the transposition of EU obligations. I can see it happening, I think probably we'll see rather a lot of it, uh, in relation to the correction of deficiencies, um, the correction of retained EU law uh, following Brexit or in anticipation of Brexit under this particular bill. But as I said at the outset, where that is proposed, it is simply on the basis that uh, it will be done subject to a non-binding requirement of consultation with um, the Scottish ministers, and I think that is unsatisfactory, and that therefore, if that's the route we're going to go down, then it should only be done with the consent of the Scottish ministers, who would in turn be accountable for agreeing to um, that legislation uh, to, to the Scottish Parliament. So these I see as being the two basic routes. I think we'll see quite a lot of um, UK or GB correcting legislation, but I think that should be done with consent on an agreed basis rather than 
we will consult you, but we may forget in the heat of the moment. Okay. Um, would it be possible, actually, for the for two legislatures to actually pass uh, valid but conflicting legislation uh, in exercise of the powers under the bill? I think not. Uh, if I recall correctly, I think um, I'm trying to remember which schedule it is, but it's a schedule which sets out the analogous powers of the Scottish ministers. One of the restrictions which is imposed on them in terms of the correction of retained EU law is that they cannot modify it in a way which is, would be incompatible or inconsistent with the modifications made by um, UK ministers. In other words, the expectation is that changes made uh, by UK ministers will be um, conclusive. Um, you mentioned a moment ago regarding the, the, the joint uh, scrutiny um, and uh, I think you said that you felt as if that was a, a non-starter. But um, if, that, if it were to be the case, in what circumstances uh, would you imagine that these uh, regulations uh, could actually be made jointly by UK ministers and devolved authorities? In what? Um, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, I know under the, the Welsh devolution settlement there is much greater provision for joint lawmaking than... Apologies, but this seems to be going... Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, then there is, um, under the Scottish devolution settlement, under the Scottish devolution settlement there are concurrent powers, but these are powers which can be exercised by either, either government. Um, I don't think, and I'm open to correction on this, there may be provision for joint lawmaking, uh, but uh, I'm not aware of it. Um, there, are, there is provision for things like the joint establishment of public authorities and so on. So I suppose that would be one possible context, because here we are talking about the possibility of setting up public authorities to exercise functions which were formerly exercised at the EU level. So, Yes, following that thought, you could have the joint exercise of powers to set up a cross-border authority, which would assume uh, functions which were previously exercised at the EU level. Okay. And uh, there are limitations and restrictions on the correcting powers in Schedule 2, uh, which apply to the devolved authorities, but not to the UK ministers uh, under their equivalent powers. Uh, examples include the, the more limited power to subdelegate uh, than is available to the UK ministers and the requirement to obtain consent uh, of the UK ministers in certain circumstances. Uh, are these additional limitations on the Scottish ministers appropriate? And what view do you take of the Scottish government's proposed amendments to remove these restrictions? Right. Uh, well, there's... There's more than, more than one such restriction, and uh, it might be worth um, uh, taking them separately. One restriction that you mentioned, I think, in your question was the restriction on the power to subdelegate. Um, and it's worth recalling uh, the basis for such a restriction generally, not just in relation to the Scottish ministers, which is essentially that we, Parliament, are giving you the power to make law in a particular area, and we expect you to exercise that power, you being accountable to that parliament, rather than giving it to somebody else, you know, which is referred to as subdelegation, uh, and which is regarded as uh, objectionable on, on, on those grounds. And so therefore I can see uh, the case for saying that this is a delegation of powers to the Scottish ministers uh, to make correcting legislation, which we expect them to exercise assuming we're not going to exercise it, um, and not anybody else for them to pass it on to whoever. Uh, so I, th I, think, I think that is understandable and is open to um, uh, explanation on, on those grounds. Other restrictions that you mentioned, uh, the absence of a power to modify, was it direct to you, law that you mentioned? Um, I think the explanation for that uh, is that the UK 
government expects or well, doesn't want to have, if you like, multiple legislatures crawling over the retained EU law statute book with the possibility of multiple changes being made, uh, which would in turn give rise to legal uncertainty. You know, one of the principles on which this legislation is based, which is probably worth recalling or highlighting um, or keeping in mind in the course of our discussion, is that it is intended to provide continuity uh, of laws. Um, and if you had several, um, because of course we have four governments in the UK, not just one, uh, if you had four governments changing the law, then it could be extraordinarily difficult for anyone who was interested to actually work out what that law was. That, I think, is the explanation uh, and could be justified on those grounds. So I, I, would, I would hesitate at just objecting to that as they can do it, we can't. We should be able to as well because that's the potential consequence of everybody being able to modify a retained EU law. And uh, my final point of the question was, do you have a view uh, on the, the amendments uh, that are, have been proposed uh, uh, regarding uh, from the uh, from the Scottish government. Um, I could understand the amendment, <laughs> uh, and I'm actually I can't actually lay my lay my hands on them. Uh, did you have any particular amendment in mind? Uh, no, just in general. For the most part, I thought they were entirely sensible, uh, but. Um, as I've indicated in general terms of my answer, I can see the reason why um, the exception might be taken to them or they might not be uh, accepted by, by the UK government. Sure. OK. And uh, in exercising the, the powers, devolved authorities may not uh, modify retained direct uh, EU legislation uh, or make a provision inconsistent uh, with a modification of retained direct EU legislation made by UK ministers. Do you foresee any any difficulties uh, with those restrictions? No, I think these are the two that we've already talked about, yeah. that um, the, or the rationale for which I, I think I've already outlined. Okay, and uh, there is no equivalent for devolved authorities uh, of the power in Clause 17 to make consequential or transitional provision. Uh, would it be usual uh, for the UK bill making provision within the, the, the Scottish Parliament's legislative competence uh, to confer such a power on Scottish ministers? Um, I, I think, I mean, attention has been drawn to Clause 17. I think too much has been made of Clause 17. It's a power to make consequential amendments, not a power to start legislating afresh. It's not an unlimited power. It's consequential on other changes which have been made. So we've changed this. This has this consequence which we need to sort out. But it's not it's not a self-standing or a freestanding lawmaking power. It is about tidying it's about tidying up amendments or changes. And actually there's a very good case, the name of which temporar temporarily escapes me, uh, in which a former Scottish judge, uh, member of the House of Lords, UK Supreme Court, Lord Roger, gives an explanation of the nature of consequential powers and basically says that these are things which uh, you wouldn't expect to see uh, in uh, a separate enactment uh, and which therefore can be uh, accepted. Clearly there's a risk of abuses, perhaps, to put it um, too strongly, but of the misuse of this power, which takes you back to the questions of safeguards. But uh, I wouldn't myself get too worked up about the fact that Clause 17 confers this power and confers it on the UK government rather than the um, devolved administrations for the reasons that we've already, I assume, the reasons that we've already talked about. So do you think, therefore, that uh, it would be necessary for the devolved authorities to actually have such a power? Um, for discussion, uh, if you are talking about consequential amendments, then I cannot actually see any problem about those changes being made by the, and it happens all the time under, under the Scotland Act, under the existing settlement, where um, 
Scottish Parliament passes legislation, there are changes which need to be made to other legislation which they don't have power to do, and the UK government makes those changes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Alison Harris. Yes, good morning, good Professor morning. Page. The bill does not provide any mechanism for Scottish Parliament scrutiny of regulations made by UK ministers alone, irrespective of whether the regulations are a matter of significance for Scotland or would have been or would have attracted the benefit of the Seoul Convention had the matter been included in primary legislation. Does this represent a gap in the Parliament's ability to scrutinise e exercise of these powers in the bill? Sorry. Thank you. Um, this is where we started, and, and I think the short answer is yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive gap. It's a gap which exists at present, but you know, which is, which uh, is considerably widened by by the bill um, as drafted. So yes. Okay. So uh, with this gap, how how do you think that could be filled? Um, yes, I've, I've been giving this some thought. Um, and uh, as I think I've already indicated, uh, I'm skeptical of the value of simply amending the legislation, uh, seeking sufficient safeguards by that route. I also have reservations about the effectiveness of parliamentary scrutiny, not necessarily in this parliament, but certainly in the Westminster parliament. Uh, and I think the general point that I would make is that in the absence of what I will call an effective system of internal control, and by that I mean within government, the UK government or the Scottish government, external control in the form of parliamentary control is likely to be ineffective. It's likely to be patchy at best. And the risk with this legislation, as I see it, is that you will have multiple lawmaking bodies in the form of Whitehall departments who will be making the provision um, that they consider, that the minister considers appropriate uh, in consequence or in anticipation of EU withdrawal. And what I see the pressing need therefore as being is to have in place an effective system of the coordination and control of this massive amount of delegated lawmaking that we're going to be looking at. Um, and I would like to see uh, a system whereby you had a high level, a cabinet committee, which was responsible for this, on which the devolved administrations would be represented, which would be have oversight of departments, legislative plans for the exercise of these powers, what exactly you're going to do in the exercise of those powers. The division of labor between the UK ministers, as we've talked about, and the Scottish ministers, what do you see being done on a UK-wide basis? What's going to be done uh, by the Scottish ministers or by the Welsh ministers or, assuming you know, the Northern Ireland Assembly is up and running again, uh, by the Northern Ireland equivalents? And, what, or, and ensuring that the kinds of safeguards that we've been talking about in terms of the exercise of powers going no further than is necessary, being appropriate and so on, are in fact you know, are observed. And I think that would provide an effective check on the exercise of those powers. I would actually like to see it sitting outside government rather than within government, but either way, I would like its deliberations to be made public. And it would provide a much, uh, it would provide a focal point for parliamentary scrutiny. So you would be what you would be checking would be not just the details of individual instruments, but just how all this is working. Uh, and taking a considered view as to whether or not the level of parliamentary scrutiny is appropriate, uh, this, whether this is an appropriate use of the power and so on. And you may say, well, you know, that's just not realistic, but I think it makes a lot of sense uh, and gets to the heart of some of the difficulties that we're likely to face uh, with this with the bill as currently drafted. So I, I would like to see an effective internal check coupled with then parliamentary scrutiny, etc. on top of that. Thank you. Stuart, have you got a supplementary yeah, on that just, point? Yeah, just on this point. Right. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Um, <clears throat> certainly what you, what you said there, Professor Page, it sounds like a, 
like a, a version of the, the GMC yeah. uh, process, and there, there have been questions regarding the uh, the how effective the GMC process has been. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, how would you uh, strengthen, uh, or what suggestions would you put forward to actually strengthen this position uh, so that uh, that that effective scrutiny that you that you touched upon uh, could actually and genuinely take place. Well, I, I acknowledge the criticisms that have been made of the intergovernmental working as uh, as we've experienced it to date, and I certainly wouldn't want to be sort of going down a route which simply perpetuated that. You know, I, I, my starting point would be that process. In many cases, has not been satisfactory. What we need is a process that would be satisfactory, a joint working process, and what would that kind of process look like? Uh, but I don't think. Uh, we can rely simply on leaving it to individual departments and then hoping that a parliament will somehow come along and exercise effective scrutiny over the exercise of those powers. So I, I would want a committee of you know, prominent politicians, as I say, it would be joint working, so it would include representatives of the devolved administrations. It would be backed by a committee of by, you know, it would be shadowed by officials. You would have your best lawyers on it, you know, who would be actually scrutinising this, um, thinking hard about you know, whether or not this is justified. Uh, and in that way, you would have some prospect of getting a grip on the exercise of these enormous powers. So I think without making concrete proposals about how you improve intergovernmental working, I think you would not simply seek to replicate that, but recognise that it has been uh, fallen short of expectations of what you would be looking for. Therefore, it would be a system which you know, addressed those shortcomings and which built confidence, and I think this is a critical factor, built confidence in the devolved administrations that you know, the kinds of fears that have been expressed in relation to what might be done in the exercise of those powers, these powers are not warranted or not justified because there are effective checks in place. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The UK Sorry. government appears to envisage consultation and agreement with the Scottish government on the exercise of powers by UK ministers. This is also the position taken by the Scottish government in its proposed amendments to the bill. This does not provide for the consultation or agreement of the Scottish Parliament. How might the Parliament hold the governments to account in relation to any such agreement? Mm. Okay. Um, so, um, well, I think the, the answer, leaving to one side what I've, I've been saying about an effective system of internal control, um, if you change the legislation so that these things can only be done with um, the consent of the Scottish ministers, then the Scottish ministers will be responsible for giving or withholding of consent to the Scottish Parliament. So that will provide uh, the starting point for the Scottish parliamentary scrutiny of a decision that this should or should not be done at the UK level rather than at the devolved level. And then separately, um, if the decision is that it should be done at the Scottish level, then um, that is a starting point for Scottish parliamentary scrutiny of what is actually proposed by way of um, correcting assuming that's what we're talking about, subordinate legislation. OK, thank you. You yes. can ask one more, and then we'll, we'll move on, because I'm conscious of time and we've got other witnesses. OK, so, well, is there a role for formal Scottish Parliament consultation or consent to the exercise of powers by the UK ministers? If so, should that role concern the exercise of powers relating to matters within the Parliament's legislation, legislative competence or matters which would be within legislative competence notwithstanding the requirement of compatibility with EU law? Or should it be something wider, such as the exercise of powers in areas of interest and importance to Scotland? How would you define that, please? Yeah. I guess this is a sort of stool question. Um, if this was being done by primary legislation, then it would require the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Um, I'm, and you could, in theory, talk about extending the Sewell Convention to subordinate lawmaking. I'm, I'm not enamoured of that particular route. I would prefer to see a route whereby 
it's being done with the consent of all of the Scottish ministers. Um, now, let me think about this. With the consent of the Scottish ministers, the Scottish ministers are accountable, as I said, but also, uh, yeah, uh, it's perfectly possible to say that this can only be done with the consent of the Scot Scottish ministers and if it's an affirmative procedure, the consent of the Scottish Parliament or subject to rejection by the Scottish Parliament. In other words, it's not. The Scottish ministers are one step in the process, but they're not the end of it. There's still a role for the Parliament over and above that of, of the Scottish ministers. Um, right, Alison, uh, I'm going to allow you another one, because apparently I can be a, a slightly more flexible. <laughs> I only have another two, actually. <laughs> Never mind if we could go quickly. <laughs> right. It may not be practical in light of, of the timetable for EU withdrawal and like the volume of instruments for the for Scottish Parliament's consent to be required to all UK instruments which make provision within the Parliament's legislative comp competence. If workload does constrict the Parliament's ability to approach all such instruments in this way, in relation to what sort of matters should a requirement for consent be prioritised? Well, I guess that's a, that's a question for for the Parliament to, to think about. Uh, but you're clearly talking about exercises of powers that are significant uh, or major as opposed to minor uh, importance. Um, there is, as you know in the Bill, provision for uh, parliamentary consent to certain kinds of instruments or instruments doing certain things. It's pretty limited provision. Uh, for the most part, it's, um, the expectation is that instruments will be subject to uh, the negative procedure. Uh, but uh, yes, I think you would be wanting to pick out those that were most important, recognizing the constraint with which you started your question, that time is indeed limited. OK, thank you. Convener. Thanks, Alison. Um, just one more from myself. Um, the bill provides for an order in council process enabling competences in areas of retained EU law to pass to the devolved authorities by the insertion of new powers in sections 29 and 57 of the Scotland Act. Any orders must be laid subject to the affirmative procedure in the Scottish and UK parliaments. So there is a formal scrutiny role for the Scottish Parliament here. Do you foresee any difficulties with the mechanism proposed for the transfer of competences? No, I don't think so. I think it's, it's modelled on Section 30 of the, um, of the Scotland Act, uh, which provides for the adjustments to the boundaries between reserved and devolved matters. This is what you're talking about in a, in, in a new context. So I think the mechanism by itself is, is not... Um, and there's no question about that. What is, of course, an issue is <laughs> you know, the lifting of the restraint uh, in relation to the Scottish Parliament's power, the Minister's power to modify retained EU law. So it's when those powers will be exercised and to what extent, rather than uh, the provision for parliamentary agreement to the, their exercise. OK. Uh, we'll move on to some questions about scrutiny and Colin Beatty. Thank you, Convener. Um, firstly, does the bill contain an appropriate split between matters which require the affirmative procedure and matters in respect of which there's a choice between the affirmative and the negative procedure? Um, well, I, I think what I would say on that is that the, what the bill, uh, the bill takes a minimalist approach to affirmative, um, the affirmative procedure. Uh, it makes provision for instruments to be subject to the affirmative procedure in a relatively limited number of areas where it might be expected to be uh, uh, to be used. The objection is that it preempts the question of the level of scrutiny to which instruments should be subject, and that therefore uh, there ought to be some sort of sifting mechanism. And you can go back to my proposal for a committee, which would say, you know, this instrument is of such an order of importance that, you know, it should be the subject of 
the affirmative as opposed to the negative procedure. In other words, that decision should not be a matter for the government alone, but one in relation to which the Parliament should have a say. Well, leading on from that, say for the mandatory affirmative procedure categories, uh, there's a wide discretion in giving regard to the choice of negative or affirmative procedure. Is that discretion appropriate? And how can ministers be held account in respect of their choice? Um, well, as I think I've indicated, uh, I don't think it is appropriate. Uh, I think um, there should be a provision for uh, parliamentary input in relation to the level of scrutiny to which an instrument is to be subject. Uh, but that I see as being part of the sort of surrounding uh, machinery of coordination, control, oversight that I've talked about, rather than something that's going to be necessarily nailed down in the legislation itself. It's something, in other words, we, we ought not to put our faith simply in the legislation itself, it's the whole surrounding uh, machinery of government, coordination, control, scrutiny that we ought to be taking into account as well, recognising the limitations, the weaknesses of parliamentary scrutiny and the need to ensure a meaningful degree of scrutiny of those instruments which are most important uh, in terms of this process. Taking into account what you're saying there, can the Scottish Parliament scrutinise Scottish Minister's choice of legislative route in correcting deficiencies and retained uh, EU law? How would they best do that? And just to explain, that's the choice of regulations made by UK ministers alone, regulations made by Scottish ministers, or regulations made jointly. Well, um, yes, as I said, it's a matter for which the Scottish ministers should be accountable to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, that sounds like a very glib, easy thing to say. Uh, I would say that it's not something about which the Scottish ministers have necessarily been accountable in relation to the transposition of EU legislation. In other words, they have, in some cases, I assume, agreed to the transposition of EU directors on a UK-wide basis, but kept completely quiet when it came to the Parliament. <laughs> not said a word about it. So we need to be goes back to my earlier point, you need to be clear about who's doing what <laughs> in relation to all of this. You know, is it going, being done on a UK-wide basis? Okay, what's the justification for that? Or is it being done on a devolved basis? In which case, you know, what level of scrutiny within this parliament uh, ought it to be subject to? But there is that sort of prior question, not just scrutiny of the instrument, but scrutiny of the decision as to where <laughs> the the subordinate legislation is going to be made, if you, if you see my point. Yeah. Well, you appear to be in favour of strengthened parliamentary scrutiny. But, for example, how, how could a role be created for Parliament to be consulted on regulations laid in draft prior to final regulations being laid? And if so, which areas should be prioritised? This is a sort of super affirmative procedure? Or? Yes, moving on. Yeah. I think that has been talked about, but there, I think there is, because of the constraints of time, I think there is, I think there's understandable hesitation about an elaborate, drawn-out parliamentary scrutiny procedure, which would involve effectively two stages uh, and would take up, take up a lot of time. Um, but if I could um, just go back a step, we're talking, of course, of, about Scottish parliamentary scrutiny here, uh, and yes, you can build effective mechanism scrutiny at the Scottish Parliament level, but I'd also like to see inter-parliamentary working. So it's not just the Scottish Parliament, this committee on its own, dealing with whatever comes down the line to it, but you know, there is involvement at the UK level as well so that you know what decisions are being made about what's going to be done where uh, and have input at that level as well. So I would like to see that. You've partly touched on my final question, which was regarding the super affirmative. Um, if we had that process for some matters, would it lead to other matters relieve it, receiving very little scrutiny, which, it, which you hinted at there, given the time available for the legislation to be passed, because it is a very tight time schedule? 
Yes, uh, I mean, there are, at the end of the day, there is a limited capacity for scrutiny. There's going to be an extraordinary volume uh, of subordinate lawmaking. There is a question about, you know, as we've been talking throughout the session, about how much it is going to be done, at which level, uh, and therefore the scale of the challenge that will be faced uh, here, as opposed to in Westminster. But, you know, I would like to see parliamentary input at every level so that you're not just as I say, faced with, you know, whatever it's... I thought it was <laughs> time to be quiet, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so you're not just faced with, you know, whatever, you know... I, how, how shall I put it? But, uh, you know, I sort of... You know, whatever comes your way with no... You know, and, and you're continually on the receiving end, but you have absolutely no influence or control over uh, what is presented to you for scrutiny at the end of the day. But that involves getting involved, at being consulted, having a say at an earlier stage in this process. Yeah. Okay. Um, irrespective of the formal scrutiny procedures which apply, what accompanying information should the UK and Scottish governments provide when laying regulations under the bill to enable Parliament to prioritise its scrutiny effort? And should a requirement to provide particular accompanying information be included on the face of the bill? Yes, I, I would, well, as much information as possible so you can actually make sense of it. Uh, what is the background to this instrument? What's it designed to achieve? You know, why are we um, doing it this particular, you know, what will the result be? Why are we doing it this way? What sort of uh, scrutiny do we propose it be subject to? Yes, all of that uh, should be um, a requirement, uh, and it should be a requirement that's policed, you know, which goes back to my earlier point about yeah. the, the need for an effective system of internal scrutiny, uh, which I might just add ought to extend to the quality of instruments, because you're going to face a big challenge with, you know, all of these are going to be drafted within yeah. uh, departments by lawyers who may have only limited experience of drafting, you know, might have, end up with instruments of variable quality. Um, so, you know, I think, yes, as much information as possible. And it shouldn't just be left to the good intentions of, of, of ministers, uh, which then results in a sort of short note, which doesn't really tell you very much at all. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. This committee often has to correct drafting errors. Mm. Mm. Um, so, final question, you'll be relieved to hear. Uh, what areas or categories of changes to EU law should the Parliament seek to prioritise in its scrutiny? Hmm. Well, where to begin? Uh, the devolved areas might be one, uh, but a general point which I've been making, uh, and which is perhaps applicable in answer to your question, is whilst there has been a great deal of focus on the powers that will be repatriated or not to Edinburgh. Those that will be repatriated to London, you know, far exceed or far outweigh in importance those that are supposedly coming the way of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and I would want to have... I would not close my mind to... Uh, those other instruments and the possibility that they have implications for Scotland, uh, uh, notwithstanding they are in the reserved areas. So I, I, I wouldn't pursue a sort of rigid, we're only interested in the devolved reserves of no interest to us mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you could well end up with instruments there which have massive Scottish implications. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Professor Page, for your time. Thanks for coming along today. Um, I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow for a change of witnesses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, um, we'll start up again. Um, so, can I welcome our next witnesses, uh, Kenneth Campbell, QC, representing the Faculty of Advocates, and Michael Clancy, and Charles Mullin, representing the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, now, you gentlemen have had the advantage of hearing our questions, uh, but you don't feel you have to give the same answers. Um, so we'll just go through them uh, as before. Um, so I'll start. So, and, and by the way, just uh, any, any one answer, just to attract my attention. The bill confers wide powers on UK and devolved ministers to correct retained EU law. Is the broad scope of those powers appropriate and necessary? Who'd like to go first? Um, I could perhaps go first. Um, yes, I think the, it is appropriate that there be broad powers for both the UK and Scottish governments and the other devolved administrations in this particular field, given the wide range of subject matter that will have to be attended to. Um, what may require attention is the level of parliamentary scrutiny mm -hmm. of the exercise of these wide powers and whether these powers can be further defined to tighten them, perhaps. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yes, I, I think uh, uh, that's right. The, um, uh, the rationale for having broad powers uh, I, the committee has heard about uh, and uh, uh, the key issues are how uh, those then come to be exercised uh, and scrutinised and that's really the, uh, uh, the issues uh, of concern. Uh, you also heard from Professor Page about the um, uh, the way in which the power is uh, formulated um, in um, uh, terms of uh, the minister considering uh, an exercise of a power being appropriate rather than uh, mm. necessary. That's maybe something we'll uh, come on to, yeah. um, uh, but that that's also seems uh, to me to be a real issue. Okay. Um, so, are the powers clearly expressed? Um, for example, it's clear in Clause 7 what is meant by the power to prevent, remedy or mitigate uh, deficiencies. What is meant by retained EU law and what constitutes a failure in it? And will it be clear whether or not a deficiency arises from the UK's withdrawal from the EU? I think um, uh, we've already made our comments to, uh, to the, um, the committee. Uh, I think uh, they've been picked up um, uh, in the press and other places. Um, we, we certainly have concerns about the meanings which can be uh, attributed to uh, words like failure of retained EU law to operate effectively. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the use of the word appropriate uh, in terms of uh, clause 7.1. Uh, and uh, the, even the idea of deficiency uh, as, as a concept is something which uh, one might uh, quibble with. Um, uh, and I think uh, the, uh, the approach which we've been taking uh, in terms of the representations which we've made to uh, the uh, Finance and Constitution Committee uh, and uh, to uh, MPs in Westminster uh, is that uh, we should aim towards uh, looking closely at uh, Clause 7 uh, and uh, seek to amend, for example, uh, the use of the word appropriate uh, to being uh, one of uh, necessity. Uh, and uh, I think that that fits in with the House of Lords Constitution Committee report, uh, which uh, had looked at that uh, very point, uh, and also um, uh, the, uh, the requirement uh, for ministers uh, to bring forward uh, uh, not only orders which are clear and understandable, uh, but wh where the minister actually has to make some kind of assertion. Uh, that uh, the uh, order is uh, necessary in his or her opinion. Okay. Do, does anyone else want to come in? Um, I, I broadly agree with uh, uh, what um, uh, uh, Michael has said about the um, uh, the text uh, around uh, appropriate. Uh, I've, I've indicated that uh, already. Um, I can see why the phrase um, operating effectively might have been chosen in, uh, in the sense that uh, um, uh, this uh, bill generally, the withdrawal bill generally, uh, is um, uh, trying to uh, 
uh, set a framework which is going to cover a very wide range of circumstances. Uh, that's why uh, I think most of the, uh, the evidence the committee has heard so far about the necessity of having broadly based powers uh, is, uh, is accepted. Um, so one can see that that's perhaps uh, the thinking behind that form of words, notwithstanding it's perhaps slightly un unsatisfactory uh, uh, texture, there is um, uh, some kind of compromise uh, built into that and really uh, the issue is um, scrutiny rather than uh, uh, the way in which uh, some aspects of this clause are articulated, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Can I just come back to you, Mr Clancy? Um, is, isn't uh, it replacing the word appropriate with the word necessity? Um, necessary. Necessary. Or, or, nece or necessary. Um, <laughs> To decide that something is necessary is still taking a judgment, Indeed. as is to decide that it's appropriate. So is it, it will just end up in the same place. Uh, well, I think there might be uh, rather more objectivity in what is necessary uh, rather than what is appropriate. Your view of what is appropriate convener might differ uh, from uh, Stuart McMillan's uh, and uh, might again uh, differ from uh, Charles or, or Kenneth's view of what is appropriate. Uh, but necessary is, is something which I think uh, might be uh, capable of more support by way of evidence um, uh, as to uh, the necessity for a provision. And remember that uh, uh, behind all this uh, order-making power lies the spectre that if the minister gets it wrong, uh, then there could be consequences. Uh, and if the minister uh, acts outside, or is found to have acted outside uh, the, uh, the competence which has been given by uh, the Act, then uh, that could be uh, uh, discovered in an action for judicial review. Uh, and uh, there could be consequences for government in that. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on that? So I think if you use the term necessary, you would have to demonstrate a particular need for the provision as opposed to something you simply want to do. And as Michael has indicated, you could support that with evidence as to why there was a need for something to be done in order to avoid uh, something that you, you know, would be undesirable. Okay. Thank you. Um, should any additional restrictions or limitations apply to the exercise of powers under clauses 7, 8 or 9 uh, and the equivalent powers of the devolved authorities? As drafted, those clauses enable ministers to make such provisions as they consider appropriate, which we've discussed. Um, can the limitations be made more objective? Well, we're back to where we started oh. a few moments again ago, aren't we? Um, I, I, think, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that um, it, not only looking at, at, uh, at Clause 7, but also at uh, Schedule 2, it's worthwhile um, commenting upon the fact that devolved authorities are also uh, in the position of UK ministers, um, uh, where they may, by regulations, make such provision as the devolved authority considers appropriate. Uh, so this is a... Um, a reflection on the bill, uh, which applies not only at UK level, but also at uh, the devolved level. Um, uh, and I hope that um, uh, Scottish ministers would be sympathetic to the view uh, that um, uh, ministerial power ought to be uh, restrained in some kind of a way uh, and not given uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, licence which uh, the bill seeks to give to both UK and Scottish ministers. Anyone else? This um, uh, uh, takes us uh, uh, again uh, to the um, a territory of whether uh, it's simply a matter of tidying up um, uh, the statute book, which is how uh, the, over the overarching purpose of the bill has been presented by the UK government. Uh, and undoubtedly there is a need for, um, uh, for that as a just to make the long work. Uh, but uh, uh, as the committee is aware, there is also a concern about uh, uh, whether um, uh, a more policy-driven um, uh, changes uh, might uh, be made. Uh, that um, uh, really underlies the, uh, the evidence-based approach which uh, Michael was suggesting uh, if the test were necessity. Uh, it's, it's rather more difficult, um, uh, arguably, uh, to uh, change the direction uh, of uh, a legal structure under the um, uh, under the heading of necessity, don't say it can't be done, but it, uh, rather than uh, appropriate uh, for exactly the uh, 
uh, uh, the reasons that Michael uh, articulated a moment or two ago. Okay, thank you very much. Um, final question uh, from me for now. Uh, Schedule 4 uh, confers wide powers to create or modify fees or charges in connection with EU withdrawal and associated changes to public authority functions. Is the scope of those powers appropriate? Um, we haven't in the Royal Society formed any particular views on that schedule. Okay. All right. Mr Campbell? Um, I'm in the same position about that. Okay, fair enough. Um, we'll move on to Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Thank you Vera. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, so the bill uh, provides a choice of three uh, legislative routes. Uh, to exercise the powers of correction, regulations made by UK ministers, regulations made by devolved authorities, and regulations made uh, jointly by the UK ministers and devolved authorities. Now, what challenges do you see arising from having that choice of legislative routes? I think there is an immediate question as regards the <clears throat> possibility of the joint exercise of powers between UK and Scottish ministers. Um, because it is not specified in what circumstances and for what purpose uh, this power would be exercised jointly. You know, one could contrast uh, this kind of broadly stated provision with the provisions of the Scotland Act, where in relation to concurrent powers that are there, the Scotland Act is very specific in the circumstances in which there are concurrent powers that can be exercised, therefore, either by the Scottish ministers or by the UK ministers. Uh, but there is no such specification as regards the exercise of, of joint powers here. And raises the question, what is the objective? Is this uh, to deal with a situation where uh, there may be a need for regulations that stray into both reserved and devolved areas uh, of policy? Uh, if that is the case, it would be helpful if the bill were to express what the purpose of this joint exercise of, of powers were, was. I, um, it, it seems to me it's quite unclear at the moment uh, wh wh when and why it's envisaged uh, the exercise of uh, joint powers uh, might be required. Um, uh, there are, as um, Charles has said, uh, circumstances um, which the Scotland Act makes provision for the, ex uh, the exercise of powers in that way. They're clear and they're relatively limited. Um, it may be that this is uh, simply an exercise of extreme caution, that all of the possible combinations need to be the, uh, there in the mind of uh, the drafter, but it really is not clear how this uh, would operate in a practical way. Uh, would you want to provide any possible circumstances as to where the, the joint provision uh, could actually be uh, utilised going forward? It may be, as Professor Page has indicated, that there might be a, a, a GB a UK approach that might be desirable where uh, all ministers are involved in putting together a, a uniform approach to a particular problem. It may be that uh, it would be useful in circumstances where there are reserved and devolved areas and the UK ministers think it appropriate to have Scottish ministers also involved. Um, one can foresee various possibilities, but it would be helpful to know from the government as to uh, what is intended by this power. Mm. Uh, have you raised that particular point uh, directly with the, the UK government for clarification on this? In, in, in uh, the Law Society's publications that have been submitted to, to Parliament and UK government, then this question has been raised. Okay. It's also worthwhile pointing out that there are something like 14 order-making powers under the bill. Um, uh, and uh, of those, six are affirmative, four negative, three attract no procedure, uh, and one order in council. So that you, it, it's it, the whole spread of current, uh, um, well, almost the whole spread of current um, uh, treatment of, of uh, subordinate legislation is, is in the bill. Uh, the one omission is super affirmative, which uh, doesn't appear there, and which is something which we have uh, argued for in our representations on the bill, uh, that that should be taken into account in certain circumstances. Okay. Yes. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, you may come to your other questions, but we, we looked in particular at the House of Lords Select Committee and their suggestions of having a triage uh, procedure whereby a minister would specify exactly what his 
regulations do, and it could then be assessed by the relevant parliament as to uh, whether they agreed with the uh, level of scrutiny that the minister was proposing and to allow for a, an affirmative procedure to be taken instead of a negative procedure where the parliament considered that appropriate. Uh, there was also the possibility of perhaps <coughs> allowing for an amendment uh, of uh, statutory instruments that are coming before a parliament uh, in a way that is not possible at present, and in a way that allowed amendment without having to restart the process again. Okay. Um, in terms of the bill, uh, would it be possible for two different legislatures to uh, actually pass uh, valid but conflicting uh, legislation? I don't think that it would be uh, possible for this parliament to uh, pass uh, valid but uh, conflicting uh, uh, measures because there is a provision uh, in the bill which limits um, devolved um, authorities, uh, including the Parliament, from making um, uh, legislation uh, inconsistent with a modification which has already been made by a UK minister. Um, I haven't been able to find uh, an equivalent uh, going the other way. Um, I don't know whether, yeah, yeah. Uh, whether it was that, that, that's, you, that's, yes. that, that's your yeah. view too, yeah. Okay. Um, there are, I mean, you touched upon limitations there. I mean, there are limitations and restrictions on the correcting powers in, in Schedule 2, uh, which apply to the devolved authorities, but not to the UK ministers under uh, their equivalent powers. Uh, examples include uh, a more limited power to subdelegate uh, than is available to UK ministers and the requirement to obtain uh, consent of UK ministers in certain circumstances. Are these additional limitations on the Scottish ministers appropriate? And what view do you take on the Scottish Government's proposed amendments to remove these restrictions? Um, I think the, one has to ask the question as to the extent, uh, and I'm looking here uh, at Schedule 2, um, uh, uh, paragraph 1-4, uh, what is the, the rationale for uh, prohibiting um, uh, regulations made by a devolved, power, uh, a devolved authority not conferring a power to legislate? And you can see there that there is one exception from that, and that is the power to make rules uh, of procedure for a court or tribunal. Uh, so acts of sedent and acts of a journal and procedural rules of tribunals will be uh, allowed to be made uh, in this uh, term. Um, I think um, uh, our, our view of the Scottish Government's amendments is that uh, these are currently a matter of political discussion between uh, the UK Government and the Scottish Government, and it would be inappropriate for the Law Society to uh, seek to uh, uh, influence uh, either of the parties, even though we can't. Um, uh, and uh, so that, that's, uh, we cannot comment on those amendments. Um, uh, what I can say is that uh, uh, in terms of, the, uh, 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 of, of these provisions, we are thinking closely about uh, this particular uh, uh, provision uh, in terms of not conferring a power to legislate because other bodies than courts may need to make changes to their subsidiary legislation too. Local authorities, statutory bodies, perhaps even the Law Society of Scotland as a statutory body, might need to make some changes. So uh, one could envisage that uh, in terms of some EU regulation uh, as yet unidentified. But you can, you can see that there are a, a number of um, uh, organisations in Scotland that may benefit from uh, having a power to make further rules. <coughs> Exploring that a bit <coughs> further, that's, that, that's very interesting. Could you, could you maybe expand on that? I mean, well, um, now that you asked me to, um, I, I wasn't prepared to, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, thank you, convener. Um, uh, I'll, I'll remember this moment. Um, uh, trying to, to trying to expand on on this. Um, uh, let's let's say that that um, a, a local authority may have the the. Uh, capacity to make bylaws uh, on planning or licensing, which may have some uh, a, a change uh, in, in, in scope in, ter in terms of 
a, a, an item of uh, retained EU law uh, because it affects food hygiene or some aspect of health and safety or something like that. Um, it, it would strike one as uh, being quite useful uh, where the, the local authority uh, to be able to uh, uh, be dealt with by the Scottish Parliament uh, and the Scottish Government in the ordinary course of events as, as we uh, ordinarily do because that is within devolved competence. Um, the, uh, there might be other uh, authorities uh, that may have similar kinds of, of um, uh, uh, constraints um, perhaps the Scottish Medicines uh, uh, Consortium or something like that. You know, so, so there, there are issues around about uh, subsidiary lawmaking power, uh, and that's why um, it, that, that might be perfectly happily dealt with uh, by uh, a UK minister um, uh, who issues an order, that's a, a fair possibility, uh, and representi representations could be made to that minister, uh, but um, it, it, that seems to cut across the, the established uh, uh, structures which we have in terms of devolution. What we're saying in, in, in layman's terms is at the moment um, a, a council, local authority, could make a bylaw um, that would be referred to Scottish ministers. What you're saying is that that uh, would no longer be the case. No, what, I, what I was saying, it wasn't, it's not that it's referred to Scottish ministers, it's that the power to make the bylaw depends on law which is made by this parliament. Right. Uh, and then this parliament, as a devolved authority, would not be able to make a, a, a provision which gives the local authority law-making power uh, to, to deal with a matter of retained EU law. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> so, in exercising the powers, devolved authorities may not modify the retained uh, direct EU legislation or make provision inconsistent with a modification of retained direct EU legislation made by UK ministers. Do you foresee any difficulties uh, with these restrictions? Um, there obviously are uh, policy restrictions that the UK government have in this bill and that they do wish to retain control over uh, the whole framework uh, of uh, retained EU law <clears throat> and how it's modified, and uh, you can see that as a, ver a very deliberate policy choice of theirs. Uh, it obviously put constraints um, on uh, the Scottish Government and Parliament, uh, but um, this seems inevitable from the point of view of the policy that has been implemented. And it's therefore it's a question of policy as to uh, where one is going on this. Um, I think that's right, and uh, in its wake comes the question of uh, uh, the uh, level of uh, scrutiny and engagement and how um, uh, the various uh, devolved institutions uh, might have uh, a place in that, and we'll no doubt come on to that. You might juxtapose the, um, the provisions of paragraph 3 with the provisions of paragraph 1, where a devolved authority is uh, given power to make regulations, uh, but that uh, this this change uh, in paragraph three uh, uh, seems to, to contradict that. There might, there might be some inconsistency within the terms of the bill in that respect. Okay. And uh, there is no equivalent for devolved authorities uh, of the power in clause 17 uh, to make consequential or transitional uh, provisions. Uh, would it be usual for a UK bill making provision within the Scottish Parliament's legislative competence to confer such a power on the Scottish ministers? I, I would have thought it wouldn't be controversial normally to allow uh, and to devolve uh, the authority to legislate for those purposes. Uh, as you say, uh, Clause 17 is restricted to the, to the UK government. And uh, to the extent that uh, consequential uh, provision can be made, it's in the rather limited circumstances uh, of the uh, Scottish ministers making a law that is designed to deal with the issues raised in Clause 7. Uh, 
Mr. Campbell. I think it's uh, it's it's important uh, in that context to. Uh, um, I, I, I agree broadly with what Charles has said, but I think it's important to also to put it in context that this is not um, an additional freestanding um, change the law uh, provision. Um, uh, this truly is a, a tidying up um, power, uh, and in that sense, it ought not to be controversial that there ought to be a scope for doing that, because it's one can clearly envisage that if Scottish ministers did exercise the powers um, uh, conferred elsewhere in the Act, there might well be uh, consequential tidying up things that would need to be done. Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Alison Harris. Good morning. morning. The bill does not provide any mechanism for Scottish Parliament scrutiny of the regulations made by UK ministers alone, irrespective of whether the regulations are a matter of significance for Scotland or would have attracted the benefit of the Sewell Convention had the matter been included in primary legislation. Does this represent a gap in the Parliament's ability to scrutinise exercise of the powers of the bill? Yes, I suppose it, it does in, in that sense, uh, and it reflects, uh, I think as Professor Page noted, the fact that at the moment we don't have any equivalent of uh, Sewell motions in relation to subordinate legislation, and, and that would be a continuation of that. Uh, perhaps the, the kind of ways uh, that Professor Page suggested might be uh, avenues which could be explored in terms of uh, different levels uh, of coordination, first of all, within governments, be it the UK or the Scottish Government, and then at a joint uh, ministerial committee level as well. Okay. Um, I think it's uh, uh, important to get a, a sense of um, um, the way in which um, coordination would need to work on a practical level. Uh, there need, uh, it seems likely that there need to be uh, intergovernmental working, first of all, at the stage of deciding what needs to be done and then uh, having uh, some realistic conversation about who's going to take responsibility for dealing with particular issues. Uh, so the coordination um, issue is key um, for two things. First of all, making it work, and secondly, working out how the scrutiny is going to best be exercised. Uh, on that point from Stuart. Thank you. Uh, I, also, I did uh, pose a similar question to Professor Page in the earlier uh, session. Uh, and certainly, uh, you'll be aware that in the past, uh, this Parliament has had uh, the, uh, discussions and uh, regarding intergovernmental uh, working and uh, the GMC process uh, in particular. And certainly, when the Scotland Bill was going through in the last session, it was uh, it, it played a, a large part in, in those discussions. Uh, would you have any suggestions uh, in terms of what type of uh, process uh, could actually be introduced that could uh, uh, that could certainly deal with the, the situation uh, in terms of uh, uh, well, uh, whether it's a strengthening of the GMC or something or some other type of process. Well, um, the GMC um, uh, has uh, certainly been the subject of some criticism over the last few months. Um, uh, uh, criticism from parliamentary committees in Westminster and indeed here. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the, the DEXU committee in its report on uh, devolution and Brexit uh, made some criticisms of it, as did the House of Lords Constitution Committee. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, the, there is a, a, a recognition that uh, there is something which is not uh, particularly functioning well there. Um, uh, how does one make that better? Well, of course, um, uh, the, uh, uh, there were meetings uh, just in the last couple of days between Scottish ministers and UK ministers uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, re-establish the JMC and put it back on a, a firmer footing. Uh, and I think we will have to watch and see uh, how that process uh, proceeds. Um, uh, could one make it stronger? Uh, well, um, uh, perhaps there could be um, a, a statutory basis uh, for the JMC, uh, but that might not find favour with ministers. Um, it, it's the sort of thing which could be uh, quite a, 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 a shift in, uh, in 
doing business uh, and intergovernmental relations uh, might not work particularly well uh, on uh, a statutory uh, basis where um, a committee has to be uh, created and, and uh, uh, functions attached to it and uh, it to be financed. Uh, so I, I think that uh, between, between there being simply uh, a, uh, an intergovernmental relationship uh, and some form of uh, statutory requirement, uh, there would have to be uh, some kind of middle way. Maybe that means extending uh, those who attend the, the JMCEN uh, to those who may be affected by issues raised on its agenda. Okay. Okay. <coughs> The UK <coughs> Government appears to envisage consultation and agreement with the Scottish Government on the exercise of powers by UK Ministers. This is also the position taken by the Scottish Government in its proposed amendments to the Bill. This does not provide for the consultation, however, or agreement of the Scottish Parliament. How might the Parliament hold the Governments to account in relation to any such agreement? Well, I can't comment on, on the Scottish Government amendments, um, but really it, it, this is ultimately a, a, a political uh, issue between you and the Scottish Ministers to sort out, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I think, uh, I, think, I think that's correct. It is uh, um, a, a matter for a, a political um, a discussion. There are, um, I suppose, um, uh, models uh, of... Um, uh, reporting and uh, uh, lay, laying material uh, before um, uh, the Parliament, and those might provide a, a starting place. But uh, uh, beyond that, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I, I can say I can say much more. Thank you. Is there a role for formal Scottish Parliament consultation or consent to the exercise of powers by UK ministers? Mm. And if so, should that role concern the exercise of powers relating to matters within the Parliament's legislative competence or matters which would be within legislative competence, notwithstanding the requirement of compatibility with EU law? Or should it be something wider, such as the exercise of powers in areas of interest and importance to Scotland? What, what do you feel about that? We uh, have suggested uh, on a number of occasions that uh, the consultation exercise it should start as soon as possible. Um, it, there is going to be an unprecedented period of uh, uh, law reform and policy development over the last, over the next few uh, um, 18, 20, 24, uh, 48 months, depending on whose uh, version of uh, uh, the, the future you uh, ascribe to. Uh, so um, I, I think, though, um, we know that uh, government, uh, both uh, in uh, Whitehall and uh, here in Edinburgh have been uh, working on uh, the, uh, the, the orders. This is, none of this comes as a great surprise that uh, civil servants are, are thinking about the transposition, the deconstruction of the supranational legal order uh, and its creation uh, within uh, the national legal order. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is not a surprise. So therefore, why should government not start consulting now uh, on these draft orders, rather than leave uh, the, that process until some time when the bill has been passed, uh, which might be March of 2018, uh, where the clock has ticked even further. Monsieur Barnier's clock ticks uh, perhaps uh, at a different rate from the rest of us. Uh, but um, uh, you can see that, that uh, you, uh, you know, the time becomes shorter and shorter the longer that we leave this process. Um, and uh, there will be relatively uncontroversial um, uh, orders which will be brought forward uh, by UK or Scottish ministers uh, that could be consulted upon uh, with relative ease. Uh, the, the more uh, tetchy, uh, tricky uh, and controversial ones, uh, they, of course, could be left until later uh, when there's a more settled view about the policy uh, route. But um, I, I think... Uh, uh, it's something that we have we've said before uh, and that we would say again. Consult now, don't wait. Okay. Thank uh, you. And, uh, just to follow that uh, uh, a little further, um, uh, there is the beginning of um, a roadmap uh, for that and the committee will be aware that uh, 
the uh, Scottish Government Minister for UK Negotiations uh, and on Scotland's place in Europe wrote to the Convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee last week um, with not only the, the Scottish Government's proposed amendments but also uh, the list of, um, or the current list perhaps we should say, uh, uh, of um, uh, areas where there are uh, powers returning from the EU. So uh, work is being done to identify those subject areas and following on um, uh, uh, Michael's uh, uh, suggestion, which I would uh, uh, agree with, uh, there, it, uh, there is the possibility of uh, getting um, uh, some work underway now, identifying key stakeholders in those subject areas um, and identifying the legislative base, which in some cases may not be large, in other cases it may be very large indeed. Okay, thank you. It may not be practical in light of the timetable for EU withdrawal and likely volume of instruments for the Scottish Parliament's consent to be required to all UK instruments which make provision within the Parliament's legislative competence. If workload does constrict the Parliament's ability to approach all such instruments in this way, in relation to what sort of matters should a requirement for consent be prioritised? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think you're quite right that you, you are going to have a, a problem of, of volume and therefore having to prioritise as to what you really want to, to look at. And uh, there obviously the creation of new bodies, the ex expenditure, uh, uh, and the kind of issues that are raised in the bill itself as regards uh, the uh, kind of issues that should normally attract affirmative resolution procedure would be one, and I think the House of Lords uh, Select Committee had also suggested that you could broaden that to include uh, having a, a considerable degree of scrutiny in, in respect of any significant policy interest or principle uh, that uh, Parliament or the Scottish Parliament would see was of value to them. Uh, but it, uh, as you say, it, it will be important to be selective as regards uh, the range of instruments that you're looking at so that you can scrutinise them effectively and without getting bogged down. Yeah. Okay. Yes. okay, so last question. If the bill is not amended to require formal consultation with or consent of the Scottish Parliament in relation to the UK regulations, which make significant provisions as regards Scotland, what other routes would you suggest should be pursued to influence scrutiny of these such regulations? Well, then they would be uh, passing in the UK Parliament and we should uh, uh, be in, in a position to uh, make sure that, that uh, uh, the concerns which might be raised uh, by uh, institutions and individuals in Scotland should be uh, referred to MPs and peers uh, as the bill uh, and those instruments go, uh, proceed in their parliamentary passage. Thank you. That's all my questions, gentlemen. Okay. Um, one for myself. Um, the bill provides for an order in council uh, process enabling competences to, uh, in areas of retained EU law, to pass to the devolved authorities. Any orders must be laid subject to the affirmative procedure in the Scottish and UK parliaments. Uh, so there is a formal scrutiny role for the Scottish Parliament here. Do you foresee any difficulties with the mechanism propose for the transfer of competence. Can't even say that word. <laughs> uh, well, I think as Professor Page indicated, this is uh, modelled on the kind of procedure that's followed uh, in respect of uh, Section 30 orders under the Scotland Act. And uh, I'm sure that seems to have been a, a process that has worked uh, satisfactorily, I hope, as from your point of view. Um, and it's it doing comparable things as regards the competencies of the Scottish Parliament and that, that heavy procedure would seem appropriate for this very important kind of issue. And I think that uh, you would find that ordinarily transfers of powers uh, are done by orders in council um, uh, and that, as Charles has mentioned, this is quite a, a, a usual thing in, in the, if one looks back over the, the history of the, uh, the Parliament, uh, there have been transfers of powers from the very earliest days, and everyone knows 
um, uh, about Section 30 orders in the same way as everyone knows about Article 50 uh, of the EU uh, uh, treaties. Uh, uh, you know that that's uh, now these are numbers which are graven <coughs> in our hearts. But um, uh, uh, it's uh, it's quite a, an ordinary process. And if one looks in the bill, you can see that that uh, the amendments uh, which uh, uh, relate to the order in council um, uh, stem from. Uh, clause 11, uh, which uh, is uh, changing the structure of the competence of Scottish, uh, Scottish Parliament and Scottish Ministers, uh, and they are Type A uh, orders. Uh, the Ordinary Council is a Type A uh, procedure, so that's uh, approval by both Houses of Parliament uh, and this Parliament. Yes, structurally. Um, that does seem to be the appropriate uh, form of procedure for doing something like this. The bigger issue, of course, is uh, uh, the scope, uh, but that's uh, for um, uh, for a, a policy uh, discussion. But uh, structurally, it, this must be the right way to do it. Okay, Colin. Thank you, Vera. Um Just looking at the scrutiny procedures, does the bill contain an appropriate split between matters which require the affirmative procedure? and matters in respect of which there's a choice between the affirmative and the negative procedure? I think the bill does highlight the kinds of issues uh, for affirmative procedure that are going to be of importance, I would imagine, to, to the Scottish Parliament uh, uh, and the UK Parliament. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, House of Lords had suggested that you could extend it to allow for some wider considerations of, of principle uh, and policy uh, that, that would require affirmative procedure as well. Now, there should okay. be discretion in relation to uh, that procedure being applied. Are there any other views on that? Well, um, I certainly think that the um, uh, topics which are uh, listed in uh, the, uh, the, the schedule as uh, requiring um, uh, the um, affirmative procedure are, uh, uh, are are absolutely correctly uh, identified. There may well be, um, uh, as others have suggested, uh, in certain circumstances which we can't immediately foresee, um, uh, cases where that might be appropriate having regard to their importance. I think that brings us back uh, to the, um, the issue of coordination and identifying um, uh, the issues and whose responsibility it is to deal with them uh, and to take legislation forward uh, and uh, what procedure uh, and the process for identifying what procedure should be uh, adopted in a given case. Well, leaving aside the mandatory affirmative procedure categories, there, there seems to be wide discretion given regarding the choice of negative and affirmative procedure. Is that discretion appropriate? And can ministers be held to account in respect of that choice? I'm not. I'm not sure that that uh, uh, the the discretion is is terribly great. Uh, I mean, the the provisions of Schedule Seven uh, uh, Two, uh, which provides the list of of um, uh, uh, topics which uh, require to be dealt with by. Affirmative resolution procedure is is followed by uh, um, uh, seven one three. Any other statutory instrument containing regulations uh, is subject to annulment in pursuance of a resolution of either House of Parliament. So uh, that's, that's, that seems to me to be quite clear um, uh, that um, affirmative resolution uh, is uh, is listed for um, those under. Uh, paragraph 1, 1 and 1, 2, uh, but when it gets to uh, 3, then those are negative resolution procedure uh, orders. The key to it is that parliamentary uh, discretion in the type of procedure to which orders should be subject has been taken away by this uh, provision. Uh, and uh, there should be some kind of a way in which uh, Parliament should have uh, a greater role uh, in being able to determine which procedure uh, should attach to which order. I think that that's where I would go to. So are you in fact saying that uh, far from there being a wide discretion, there's in fact almost no discretion? <laughs> 
a discussion between uh, choosing a negative and affirmative resolution. I'm prepared to be corrected, but I, I don't see it. Hmm. Interesting. How can the Scottish Parliament scrutinise the Scottish Minister's choice of legislative route in correcting deficiencies in retained EU law? And by way of explanation, the, the choice of regulations made by the UK ministers alone, regulations by Scottish ministers, or regulations made jointly? Well, the, uh, as regards the exercise of discretion, I think Michael has answered the, the, the question uh, previously. Uh, and as regards your uh, second part of that question, you're talking about how, how can one um, identify or, or uh, hold to account ministers uh, in relation to their choice of whether the FITS are going to use jointly exercise powers or um, uh, uh, just exercise individually. Well, um, as I say, it is unclear at present as to the circumstances in which ministers would exercise joint powers. So I think if that were clarified in the first place and perhaps tightened up, it might be a much more certain basis for ministers to proceed and the parliament would also, uh, uh, the two parliaments would also know where ministers are likely to be going and why they're going in that particular direction. You're all agreed on that? Yes, I don't venture to add to that. Okay. Really, uh, the, the best way to call ministers to account is to invite them to defend their regulations before this committee um, uh, and uh, before the lead committees for policy questions. <laughs> um, is there a role for strength and scrutiny, for example, to enable Parliament to be consulted on regulations laid in draft prior to final regulations being laid, and if so, which areas should be prioritised? That is the, the super affirmative procedure, uh, which is uh, currently within the scope of this committee. Um, uh, and the super affirmative procedure is not uh, structurally in the bill. Uh, so uh, the best way to, to ensure that would be uh, for amendments to be made to the bill. So you're saying as the bill stands at the moment, the super affirmative would not be possible? Yes. Well, what I'm saying is it is not within the structure of the bill. Um, I, I, the, the, in the structure of the bill, the bill does that it's mean not, it's possible or not? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think uh, uh, you would be presented with the orders in the way in which they are mandated under the bill. Yeah. Okay, that makes my next question a bit tricky, but nevertheless, I'll still ask it. Um, <laughs> assuming a super affirmative type process is possible, um, for some matters at least, would this lead to other matters receiving very little scrutiny, given the time available for the legislation to be passed? That's inevitable. Um, the volume of uh, uh, work which um, uh, this committee and possibly other committees uh, of the Parliament are going to be engaged with in the coming uh, months, uh, whether it's uh, 12, 24 or 48, uh, is going to be significant. The, uh, the UK government white paper estimates, their estimate is over a thousand legislative instruments um, are uh, going to be uh, required. Um, that may prove to be an underestimate. And if that's correct, uh, given um, the proportionate, uh, even taking a proportion of that as the legislative work of this parliament, in addition to other legislative work which the parliament will be engaged with, I think uh, it's inevitable that, um, uh, that some areas will receive less scrutiny. And as Ms Harris's questions raised as well, there, there was the issue of prioritising as to what you would really be interested in uh, in terms of scrutiny. And if you wanted innovative forms of scrutiny of delegated legislation, then that would require amendment of the bill. And in the publication that the Law Society has, has made, we've referred to the House of Lords Select Committee's suggestions uh, and to other suggestions as regards how you might have innovative approaches to scrutinising the legislation you were really interested in. Uh, but th there must be limitations of time, as, as Kenneth has, has indicated. Okay. 
What was that publication you referred to, House of Lords? The House of Lords Select Committee. Uh, the constitution. The, yes, uh, on the Constitution. And uh, I can uh, get your reference to that. I could provide a reference to the clerk. Huh? We, can we, we can provide a reference uh, to, to the clerk at the end of the meeting. Uh, I believe we've got, we've got a link to that, so have, have a yep. look at that. Thank you very much. Um, so just a, a couple of questions uh, uh, from myself. Uh, what accompanying information should the UK and Scottish governments provide when laying regulations under the bill to enable Parliament to prioritise its scrutiny effort? Uh, should, there be, should a requirement to provide particular accompanying information be included on the face of the bill? Uh, well, again, as in our, our, our suggestions, and again referring to the House of Lords' uh, suggestions, we thought it would be useful for ministers to specify in explanatory notes with uh, any instrument exactly uh, what is being uh, achieved by this instrument, and if one were to amend the past, why it's necessary uh, in, in these particular circumstances, whether it's making a, uh, a policy or a purely technical change, and I thought that would greatly help uh, Parliament's scrutiny of any such leg legislation. Yes, I, 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 think, I think that uh, is uh, absolutely right. Um, uh, the only way in which it would be possible to, to do the prioritisation that we uh, spoke about a moment uh, ago is to have a clear idea of whether an instrument is uh, simply uh, doing what the policy of uh, the withdrawal bill is supposed to be, namely moving the legal basis from the EU to domestic law or whether there is some more substantive change being made to um, the domestic legal order and it should be incumbent on the minister, whether it's a UK minister or a Scottish minister, to identify that. After all, the vast majority of the instruments will be dealing with purely technical changes which probably won't be of interest to anyone, but it, the key will be in identifying the ones where some policy or substantive provision is being made, which you will want to have a look at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what areas or categories of changes to EU law should the Parliament seek to prioritise in its scrutiny? Hmm. Well, <laughs> that, I mean, one, one could, uh, it, it's easier to say what you, you shouldn't prioritise, isn't it? I mean, you shouldn't prioritise uh, those, those, uh, purely technical issues which are, are of minor importance. Um, it's easier to, to, to put those to one side and, uh, and uh, look at them afterwards. Um, uh, clearly, uh, things which uh, would fall within the affirmative uh, um, resolution procedure provisions in uh, Schedule 7, uh, such as establishing a public body or, or um, uh, widening the scope of criminal law uh, or imposing some kind of fee. Uh, but, um, you know, thinking about widening the scope of a criminal offence um, uh, or imposing a fee, uh, we, uh, we might think in there in terms of fines, but, but there are also civil penalties which might apply. Uh, things like that might be uh, the sort of thing which, although it's not in the list, you might want to uh, uh, to think about prioritising as well. Um, uh, and uh, so I think that those are the kinds of areas where the liberty of the subject is, is at stake um, uh, or where um, uh, there is uh, some uh, financial in implication. Okay. Um, I think uh, uh, that the um, affirmative action, uh, affirmative procedure rather, uh, uh, cases are probably going to be the the more uh, controversial or contested areas anyway. Um, and given the uh, discussion we've already had about uh, available time, that would be my suggestion for a starting place as well. Okay. Members have any other questions that haven't come up? No? Okay, well, I'll close this session. I kind of thank uh, Mr. Clancy, Mr. Mullen and Mr. Campbell for your time, the clarity of your answers and uh, I was uh, glad to have given Mr Clancy his moment to remember. One among many. Thank you. And I'll suspend briefly to allow you to leave. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item three, instruments subject to affirmative procedure. Colin. Mayor, I would just like to declare an interest at this point. Uh, um, I am a, a registered landlord and I would point members to my declaration of interest. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Draft Scotland Act 1998 uh, specification of devolved tax wild fisheries order 2017. The draft private residential tenancies statutory terms Scotland regulations 2017. The draft private residential tenancies information for tenants Scotland regulations 2017. The draft public appointments and public bodies act Scotland Act 2003 amendment of specific specified authorities order 2017. The draft land reform Scotland Act 2016 supplementary provision regulations 2017 and the draft land reform scotland act 2016 supplementary consequential transitory and saving provisions regulations 2017 is the committee content with these instruments okay agenda item four instruments subject to negative procedure uh, public Water Supplies Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017 281. This instrument amends the Public Water Supplies Scotland Regulations 2014 to implement provisions of Commission Directive EU 2015 1787 on monitoring requirements for drinking water and of Council Directive 2013 51 Euroton on radioactive substances in drinking water. There are a few drafting errors in this instrument. In new Schedule 1A to be inserted into those 2014 regulations, paragraph 4.3 of Part E on radioactive substances provides that where indicative dose requires to be monitored, the frequency of the monitoring must be determined depending on the screening strategy and I've lost my word there. Uh, adopted pursuant to part B of schedule 1A the Scottish Government has confirmed that the reference to part B is an error and that the reference should be to part F instead. In table 1 in part B of new schedule 3 to substitute it into the 2014 regulations in the second column of the table headed uncertainty of measurement, the value given for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons is 30. The Scottish Government has confirmed this is an error and that the value should be 50. In Table 2 in Part B in New Schedule 3 in the fourth column of the table headed limit of detection, the value given for oxy disability is 25 the Scottish Government has confirmed this is an error and that the value should be 10. It suggested the committee could report the instrument order under ground I as the drafting appears to be defective, as I've just outlined. The committee could welcome the Scottish Government's intention to correct the instrument by making and laying an amending instrument at the earliest opportunity. Does the committee agree to report the instrument to the Parliament under reporting ground I as the drafting appears to be defective. Okay. And does the committee agree to welcome the Scottish Government's intention to correct the instrument by making and laying an amending instrument at the earliest opportunity? Okay. Teachers' superannuation and pension scheme additional voluntary contributions Scotland regulations 2017 SSI 2017 283. Regulation 14.8 contains a superfluous reference to Regulation 12.5 of the instrument. The committee could note that the Scottish Government has undertaken to correct this error in the next set of regulations to include amendments of this instrument. Does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground as they contain a minor drafting error? Okay. 
Individual Learning Account Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-288. It's intended by Regulation 67D to substitute, quotes, training account administrator for learning account administrator, comparably with several other substitutions in the instrument. However, in error, the provision specifies a training account administrator and a learning account administrator. Does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground as there is a minor drafting error in Regulation 67D, which amends Regulation 46 of the Individual Learning Account Scotland Amendment Regulations 2011? Great. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI's 2017-286-295-296-297. Two nine seven and three oh one. Is the committee content with these instruments? Content. Okay. Agenda item five instruments <coughs> not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI's two thousand seventeen, two nine four and two nine eight. Is the committee content with these instruments? Content. Okay. I now move the meeting into private session. <coughs>